بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا حبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. There was something that I wanted to uh, talk about today, actually, that was really heavy on my heart, and I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to bring it to you because I read in the there's a narration that our mother Aisha رضي الله تعالى عن when she was in the end of her life. That she was known to actually sit alone and cry and say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, what is this thing that you created called Aisha? Right? What is this thing that you have created, Ya Allah? Where basically, you know, uh, by the time she reached her late 50s and early 60s, that it was something that she even, she was like contemplating. It's those moments you begin to go over your life and you start to say, like, you know, who am I and what have I done and what have I accomplished? And one of the things that for me reminds me of it, like it really heavy, is that when, it just, when the Prophet actually describes that first, what they call the minor day of judgment, that when the angel of death comes and he takes the soul, subhanAllah, taking it from this portion and, and, and it begins to be removed, and then they wrap the soul. Either it's taken, of course, with, with gentleness and love, like said, so like milk being poured from a pitcher. Oh, wait, yeah, the I don't want to talk about the opposite. That's not what I'm talking about today. <laughs> but subhanAllah, then they, the angels actually come and they wrap the soul either in a very beautiful cloth or a very a putrid smelling, like wretched cloth. And as they're going, um, through as they're going through the heavens for this what's considered the minor day of judgment the angels approach the first door of heavens and they ask and the angels basically they ask for permission and they say well who is it right who is it that's come and they say well this is such and such and they give the person's name and they say you know their lineage like this is fatima uh, the daughter of Muhammad, alayhi salatu was you know, the, the son of Abdullah. So they begin to give a list. And then they say, well, what was said about this person, right? And so then the, basically the angel who's accompanying the soul begins to repeat what people said about the person in the world. So if they say, well, this is a dhakira, this is a saliha, right? This is a mukhnisa, this is someone, this is a woman of charity, this is a woman of kindness, this is a woman of, right? This is a, a, a woman of salah. She's of those who used to cry to Allah in the night. This is a masha'Allah, this is Ahl al Quran, this is someone of Quran. And then the angel, subhanAllah, actually then allow, right? Allow this soul to then enter that level uh, of the heavens. Until they reach the seventh. And at this particular, this, this seventh, this gateway is, they say it, to the, to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where it becomes a, an, another level. And at this level, subhanAllah, when it's, when it's basically the words are, you know, that they've been hearing about this soul are then pretty much weighed. To not on a scale, it's different. It's not the mizan, it's not the major day. But this is their kind of weighed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually speaks because there's a judgment that's given about how this soul will return to the grave. And so subhanAllah, at each uh, door, for example, in the beginning, it's like, okay, did, is this a person of shahada? Is this someone who then prayed their prayers? Did they pray it correctly with the correct fiqh? Then it's like, okay, did they pray it, you know, with concentration? But then, subhanAllah, when they get to this, and it's, of course, it's not just only the salat, but other actions, other deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked of them. But when they get to that seventh door, it's the door of sincerity. Right? It's the gateway of sincerity. And so now it's no longer about what the people have said. It's no longer about the words that have actually been thrown out. It's actually now is it that what they've presented to the people, yes, inside the masjid they were from the Musalin. Right? Yes, you know, and, and with their family, they were those who prayed. But when everyone left, did they actually pray? Right? That when everyone, you know, they were the people who were generous and kind in front of people, right? But maybe, subhanAllah, what did, you know, when their children speak about them, what do they say? Does it match? But then at that door of sincerity, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now speaking to the internal condition of that soul. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is then saying, actually, وَإِيَّادُ بِلَا مِنْ 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not number us in, in this category of those I'm about to describe. But there are those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says to the malaika, actually they were not of those who prayed. There was no khudu, there was no khushu, there was no hudur, there was no ikhlas, that they prayed in front of people. And the scary part in this narration is that it speaks to that these deeds, subhanAllah, are then some of them are thrown back on this person's face. Right? And the angels will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I didn't, I, we didn't know. Right? We didn't know, we didn't know what was in their hearts. We're just looking at the record. And according to the record, they prayed. Right? Fajr, we have it. The words, we have it. It's written that they prayed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, now we're looking at their internal condition. And that determines how that person is going to spend their time in the grave. I didn't speak to the depth of that, subhanAllah, with your daughters. Right? And we're like, oh my God, is that what she's saying? No. Oh. But when we're talking about identity, that for us, it's, a, it's, it's different. Right? Sometimes we do things because it's like that's what we've been doing. We, I, you know, I grew up doing that, or that's what my family does, right? Or we do it because that's the group of people that we are around. But in reality, there shall there will come a day when the truth of who we are will speak, as we know that on Yom Qiyamah, Subhanallah, our eyes will speak and tell Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala exactly what happened, right? Our mouth will speak and not from our command. Right? Our hands will speak and not from what, you know, not from our command. That these things, and I, I ask subhanAllah, like, why would our eyes speak? Why are our ears going to speak? Why are our hands going to speak? Because they're going to tell the truth of the reality. Right? They're going to be able to say, listen, this is what really happened. Right? This is, this is, this is the reality of this human being. And then you're not, that day, you won't be able to cover it up. Right. And so then it becomes incumbent upon us to be able to say, who am I really? And how am I going? Not only to, this is not just about my integrity. How am I going to really be come amongst the mu'mineen? How am I going to really be who the people of, of the salihin, salihat? How am I really going to gain the kind, of, the kind of internal character, the kind of internal purity, the type of internal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's going to be something that I know that my deeds are not going to be thrown back. I, like, it's not just subhanAllah, because it's true. Sometimes we pray because other people are praying. Or... We even pray because, okay, we told our children we have to pray, so now we're praying for it. Right? But what is it for us to say, I don't mean, no, I, I'm not. I'm not even praying to you when we get to the level, right? I'm not even praying to you because you, you, you commanded me. I'm praying to you because I love you. I worship you because you're Allah and you deserve to be worshipped. I worship you because I love you. I worship you because I want a relationship with you, right? I want to be close to you. I want to be exactly who it is that you created me to be. I don't want any other being, any other woman. I don't want to be her. I want to be the woman you want me to be. Adore me with the qualities that you love. Make me that person. That's really what our ibadah is about. I, and that's really what our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about. Because there, there are two things. We'll look at them. We, you know, if we look at them on the higher level, we say, oh Allah, if I don't get the house of gold, right, or the house of pearls, or the streets of gold, or the one scarf, one woman's scarf in Jannah will be worth the entire dunya and everything in it. Right? One of her scarves. Some women are like, I remember one time I told a group of that, and they're like, wait, we have to wear hijab in, in, uh, in the Jannah? <laughs> and I was like, if you want, it's just, right? it's just one of her scarves. It's just like an, an accessory if you want it, right? And that is worth more than everything in the dunya. But even in that, are we thinking about, are we thinking about, Ya Rabbi, I want Jannah because what you got to give me? Because the stuff, right? Like that's, that's on the akhirah side. On the dunya side, 
But we're saying, well, you know, I'm worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because, you know, he'll give me success. He'll give me money. He'll give me a family. He'll give me this or that or, or whatever. My children will be, I'm praying for my children. You know, I want my children, I want my child to be a surgeon, right? Or the next CEO of this company. Or I want, you know, I, I just, I don't want them to, I don't want them to do bad things. So I'm praying because I just don't want my children to do bad things. Why? Because I don't want to be ashamed in public. I don't want, you know, I don't, that we're, we're really, even though, subhanAllah, it's, it, we're inside the deen, right? We're coming to the masjid, we're doing all the things, but then there's an underlayer of like, still I'm concerned for, I'm still concerned about what people think of me. Uh, really, I worship Allah, not really because I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because I just worship Allah because I'm just afraid that if I don't, then I won't have a good life. That still, right? It's still you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon what he gives you or he doesn't give you. It's still not a relationship with Allah. It's actually deen for dunya. Actually, there's still, believe it or not, you're saying, well, I'm not, you're, we're not outside the fold of Islam. We're Muslim, but there's still a shirk in our ibadah. We're still associating something with our ibadah. Right? We're still associating my worship with Allah with what he's going to give me. That's why I'm worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because he's Allah, but, you know, like, yeah, I know he's Allah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, alhamdulillah. But I don't really have a relationship with Allah. What I have a relationship with is like, I want a good husband, right? I want a really nice house in the suburbs. I want like a two-car, right? I want like the minivan and the SUV. You know, maybe if my husband gets a motorcycle, he can go on the weekends. Whatever it is, <laughs> right? Whatever it is. This is, for us, where we have to be concerned with, right? Because what if, what if you are tried? What happens if, what happens if you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is our current state? What if I'm worshiping Allah and I'm still tried? I'm worshiping Allah and I still get sick. I'm worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something still happens with my family. Something still happens with my marriage. Something still happens with my health. Something still happens with my children. What happens then? Sometimes people lose their iman because they're saying, well, Ya Rabbi, I worship you, so now you owe me. Hey, I worshiped you. How, how did I get here? This wasn't supposed to happen. And it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the secret about yourself that you weren't willing to tell yourself. And that is, you're worshiping me because of what I give you or I don't give you. That the relationship is not sincere. The sincere relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that moment of Hajjah. When she's in the desert all by herself and a child. Right? Like, seemingly, you got nothing. You got no home. You've been long taken from your tribe. You've got no land of your own. Meaning, you're, lo you're far away from your original country. You're far away from any tribe who knows anything about who you are. At that time, Hajar did not speak the language, subhanAllah, of what would become the Meccan Valley. <laughs> so you are totally foreign. It doesn't even matter that you're foreign because ain't nobody here. <laughs> right? Nobody's even here. And then when they come, they don't know you. So you're, you could still be alone in a group of people. That's when I think about our mother Hajar. I think about that. And then, subhanAllah, it's not just, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm alone in a group of people. I'm in a strange land. I don't have the protection of my husband. I don't have the comfort of my family. I don't have like my sister. I can go over to her house and laugh about it. Remember when we were kids and dad did that. I don't have any of that. But on top of that, I still have to maintain a level of strength for the, to raise this child, I still have to maintain a level of happiness to raise this child. I still got to maintain, I got to show up every day as a mom and be perky and be a role model. Right? She's, that's another, for, some people like, oh, that's comfort. That's like, whoa, y'all. Right? 
that honestly, it's seeming like y'all don't be. I, 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 I already suffered. Like I, I came, I came, I showed up. Why? Our mother Hajim, and I talk about her a lot, cause her her life for me is just fascinating. Her life for me, just her moments of like, it's just absolutely fascinating to me. Like, what kind of iman is that? What kind of tawakkul is that? What type of yaqeen is that? What kind of perseverance is that? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm going to build the whole city around you. Like, like this relation, this like the 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 ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brags about. Right? The ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brags about in the Quran. I'm like, subhanAllah, this is just this is something amazing. This is that's something we could just study their life. But when you are, if you imagine those moments, she has to have one thing clear. That if all those things about my identity are stripped away, my culture doesn't matter in this moment. My tribe doesn't matter. If I had any money, I don't have it now, <laughs> right? If I had a if I had a great husband who was very influential, mashallah, my husband was a prophet. Of, my husband is a prophet of Islam. Well, he's not here now. Now, who are you? Now, who are you? What's the importance of it? And that's when we get to the most baseline answer that we are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are his creation that we are his creation he created us and we're going back to him and the only thing that's actually going to to matter all the other stuff literally is going to is going to decay in the grave what's going to matter is who we were to Allah and who we are to Allah. That's what's gonna matter. And not the if you even if we associated, right? The give or the not give, the the, the fear of the give and take with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not even gonna that's not even that part is gonna crumble. <laughs> and it's gonna be like, are you sure you had a relationship with me? Or did you just have a relationship with your hopes and fears? So that's what we have to distill down to. Ya Allah, do I have a relationship with you? Do I know you? I, do I praise you? Do I spend time just contemplating with you? Not connected to other people? Not connected even to myself. This is what our great scholars and the Oliya used to talk about when they talked about the annihilation. When Allah, I'm just I'm just something you you created. The only thing that's going to matter, that's going to matter, make any difference about who I am. About all of my identity of who I think I am in the world. <laughs> the only part that's going to matter is who I was to you. And what my relationship is with you. And so even as you're reading the Quran. I, you got to think about. Ya Rabbi. From this Quran. Teach me about you. How do I, the, the lessons, when you're telling me the story about Musa and Khidr, what does it tell me about you? When I'm learning the story about Maryam, what does it teach me about you? When I'm reading through the Quran and learning the lessons about the two men in the garden in, in Surah Al-Kaf, what does it teach me about you? Ultimately, the only reality is La ilaha illallah. And even inside of the next of it, Muhammad Rasulullah is, is just to guide you back to who is your Lord. 
Even the Prophet is just saying, I just came to you, I just came to show you who is your Lord. I just came to guide you back to who is Allah. I just came to teach you how to be loved by Allah. How to be loved by Allah, how to matter to Allah, how to be noticed by Allah, how to be accepted by Allah. That's that's what the Prophet and now that's a big deal, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Right? <laughs> That's why he say you did not. Because even inside of the the who the Prophet who he is, right? And there are things about him that you know that show us that like okay, yes, no, he's out of he's from this family, blah, blah, blah. but in the end, what matters about the Prophet said, I came to I tra- I I came to connect you to Allah. I came to I came to lay the pathway so that your pathway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be easy. So even subhanallah, as you are identifying ourselves as wives, as mothers, do you identify yourself as a wife to say, I'm here to say, how can I make my husband's pathway to Jannah easy? How can I be closer to Allah through him, by him? By my relationship with him, I become closer to Allah. Why? Because Allah is the reality. Good or bad? How are my children a means by which I become closer to Allah? And when it comes to my relationship with my children, how am I a pathway by which they get to Jannah easy? Why? Because if I become the pathway by which they know Allah, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So are we a means of ease for them to meet Allah? Or are we actually an obstacle in their way to their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we think about the people in our life, are we a means by which we facilitate their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ease? Are we like a spoke in the wheel? Are we a reminder? Are we a warning? Are we a blessing? Are we a guidance? Who are we? At the end, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I created you for no other purpose except to worship me. Meaning that once you once you understand that, like it's about your relationship with me, all that other stuff, if you still want it. If you still want it, I'll tell you a, a narration. It's a true story. Where once I was sitting with my, uh, it's a group of women. We were in a, like a, you know, we we're having like a gathering in my house. And and we went around and we asked everyone, what is it that you yearn for? What is it that you yearn for? And everybody, you know, we were in the desert at the time. So some people were like, I yearn for a washing machine. Some people were like, I yearn for air conditioning. I was like, I yearn for red lobster. <laughs> my people were like, what do I yearn for? And we got to my teacher, and my teacher said, I, I yearn to gaze upon Allah and never blink. And that's a description of the highest level in Jannah. The people who are just in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they never blink. Now there's another level where people see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Jummah. Right? And there are some who see, you know, but they're the highest level of those who are in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they never blink. Now some of us, I remember when she said it, I thought, do I even have a heart that knows to yearn for that? Do I have the kind of soul that knows that that's something valuable? Or do we start thinking about, well, do I get to go back down to my house made of pearls? Like, is, am I still going to get the streets of gold? Like, am I still going to get, like, the super handsome husband? I, some of us are still thinking about the stuff, which means that we didn't understand yet. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Allah is so kind, so generous. He gives us, like, different... He's like, let me just kind of coax you. <laughs> You're going to be beautiful. It's going to be great. You're going to have a great time. But really, really, it's, it's about Allah. <laughs> really, it's about Allah. Allah 
I want to remind you of this, just this last verse. And it's, you know, we think about it when we talk about each other and sticking together as an ummah. But I'm talking about it just as it relates to us. Right? Hold on together to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. Most we're talking, you know, people think we're talking about like, you know, this is about the community sticking together. This is also about don't let your nafs separate from your heart. And don't let your heart separate from your mind. And don't let any of it separate from your soul, from your ruh, your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let your nafs take you away from Allah. Don't let your heart, right, that which you're in love with, your spouse, your children, your job, your status, whatever. Don't let your heart take you away from your ruh, which is your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let your mind, well, I've got to earn this much money. Well, I've got to do this in society. Oh, no, but, you know, Tony Robbins says that I've got to do. Heck, don't let your, <laughs> don't let your mind take you away from your ruh, your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the verse what it's really about. There's, yes, there's multiple. But the reason why we get splintered in communities is because first we're splintered inside of our own selves. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك بك شهد وانا اين انا انت وانا استغفرك وانا توبو اليك. Any questions? So let me say this. Sakhrat, I don't know his, I don't know if he's in Sakhrat al Mut or not. Um, but I will say this. First of all, angels are not always as beautiful as we think. I know we, we think of like the Hollywood version, right? But they're not always like that. Um, that also, subhanAllah, believe it or not, ugly faces can be a means by which a person will say, La ilaha illallah. <laughs> right? And so they, they, that might even be a means of, of prodding, of encouraging. Right? The person to say, La ilaha illallah. Like, or even to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it doesn't necessarily, I don't want you to just assume straight away, is that a bad thing? Well, you know, that if that person then sees that and says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim that's a good thing, right? Uh, if it becomes a means by which they run, they flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that becomes a good thing. Um, the other thing is, is that these are also reminders, of course, for us to always repent, right? And this, so, alhamdulillah, so even in, in this case, if you see them, la ilaha illallah, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, la, you know, a'udhu, like, Allahumma a'udhu billahi. Right? Like asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. So either way, alhamdulillah, even if him saying it became a means by which he said, recite Quran for me. Right? Then this is become this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is facilitating a good ending for him. Inshallah bi khair. Inshallah or shifa, whatever Allah intends, I don't know. Um so don't so that's uh, like even if it's he if he's saying the Qarin, even if he's saying Shayateen, or he's saying very fierce angels. Right, because even Omar ibn Khattab, when he described, uh, you know, when when there was one other Sahaba who uh, that Omar ibn Khattab he passed away before this other Sahaba, and so when this who I think uh, when this Sahaba uh, basically he saw Omar in a dream, and he asked Omar like, how was it? Right, he asked Omar how was it, and Omar described Munkar and Nakir, and when he described Munkar and Nakir, uh. It's scary, right? He said that his, uh, he said, first of all, their eyes were like cauldron pots, like huge. He said, I could see them even like mountains, like just the, like the span of mountains. And he said that he was blue, black in color, and that his, when he blinked, his eyes flashed like lightnings. He said his teeth were like mountain pegs. Sorry, his teeth were like mountain pegs. And he said, when, when Munkar spoke, he said it sounded like Rolling intense thunder. Well, this is Omar al Khattab. It's Ashra al Bashara. Right? That's not like, I know we were thinking it was going to be like fat little cherry bumps. Right? Like, you know, flying around. Like, like, you know, no, no, it's not like that necessarily. Right? And this is very, but, but subhanAllah, what it tempted Omar to do as a result. Right? When, alhamdulillah, <laughs> shukrillah, when the uh, angel spoke to Omar, he said, you know, he said, man rabbuk, 
which I can't imagine what that's like, uh, you know, like rolling in the man rub book. And it says that Omar grabbed him, <laughs> grabbed this angel and said, man rub book. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm like, who's your Lord? Like, who are you? And then he became, mashallah, he said, yeah, I'm just Mu like, yeah, yeah, Omar, I'm just Mu I'm coming to take the report. <laughs> take the report, subhanAllah. And he said, okay, then la ilaha, then my answer is la ilaha illallah. <laughs> so subhanAllah. And, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. <laughs> and sitting, Allahu Allah, Allahu Allah, Allahu Allah, la ilaha illallah. Just, just keep to reciting his names. <laughs> that one. Especially in Witr. Especially in Witr. Spending uh, or just uh, in Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud, sitting in the night when everybody's sleeping, right? And you just communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reflect upon the sweetness of your relationship with Allah and just like, Ya Rabbi, that time you saved me from that, that time you reminded me of that, that time you removed that from my heart. The more you reflect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the other, you, of uh, course. It's a pretty scarf. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A scarf, go okay, keep just fine. Who okay. cares? Ya Rab, give me you, Ya Rab. Ya Allah, give me Allah. <laughs> That's what we want, Ya Allah. SubhanAllah, yes. Yes. So the first thing is, is that, uh, know this. We all have sins in our hearts, <laughs> right? We all have sins of our, sometimes, we ourselves don't recognize the sins of our own heart, right? Sometimes we, that's just not something we, we haven't dealt, you know, delved that deeply into our own soul. We haven't spent time with ourselves long enough to kind of contemplate it. And so in those moments of desperation, when we're crying out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I would say this like falls out, right? Um, believe that's actually one of the beauties of the broken heart is that the beauty of the broken heart is that when it breaks, you're able to see the contents, the true contents of your heart, right? And so you're able to say, SubhanAllah, I didn't know that uh, in reality, vanity was there, right? Uh, I didn't know that, wow, I, I didn't realize, like, this is about my greed or this is about my ego, right? And so sometimes it's not until our hearts are broken that we, we get exposed to our own selves but the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is if he exposes you to yourself, it's a good sign. It's a very good sign. This is that he, he said, you know, you got to come back to me. So you have to come back to me. And I want to give you the highest level of Jannah. But if you have this quality, you won't be able to go in that place. So let's, let's work. I'm going to show it to you so I can work on it. And then if I'm, if I'm giving you, subhanAllah, the tawfiq to make dua about it, that's, even, <laughs> that's like even better. Because of Allah saying, well, ask me about it. Ask me about, like, subhanAllah. You don't even have to have, like, all the tools. Like, you don't have to know all the things. You don't have, you know, the Allah say, ask me about that. So I can help you with it. So we can. And so, um, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, la ilaha illallah. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to heal the root of it. Right? And to heal the memory that is connected to it. So, again, um, sometimes it can be an event or a principle that we've held that we have to get, you know, to the bottom of it. Because if not, what happens is, is that when the root of it, when the root of the sin isn't healed, then usually we're bound to commit that, to have that continuously. But the biggest, the biggest obstacle to removing a sin of the heart is the unwillingness to admit it. Because the unwillingness to admit it will not lead one to repent from it. And the greatest help is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to ask for his tawfiq. So the, the first thing is to just be able to tell yourself the flat truth about that. Right? And then all of us have something. We have to tell ourselves the flat truth. Like, actually, you know, Aisha, you, 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 know, you were really vain about that. Well, you know, actually, Aisha... You know, um, you have a deep sense of a deep sense of entitlement, right? Or actually, yeah, Aisha, you know, you you thought you were better because you were 
American. Well, you thought you were better because you were educated. Or you thought you were better because you came from, you have more money. There are lots of things that we tell ourselves that later on we're like, I like my mom. And alhamdulillah, it doesn't make you a horrible person. It makes you a really good person carrying around a very bad trait. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, if you, again, when it happens, if you don't commit, if you don't do this to yourself, or if you don't pacify yourself, it's okay, everybody sins, everybody has mistakes, well, I am better, because, I mean, you know, I am cuter, or whatever, <laughs> right, or whatever we tell ourselves, as long as we don't pacify ourselves, to be honest, like in our day and age, we we are uh, we're the we're the generation of don't pass judgment, <laughs> right? No, like, you better pass some judgment because judgment is gonna get passed, <laughs> right? So it better be a good thing right now if you just say no. Really, that quality is not a quality of oh, no judgment. You gotta get rid of that. Um, without putting yourself back in the way. Hear what I'm saying for that? How do we put ourselves back in the way? Even if we beat ourselves up to the point of having low self-esteem, then we have still committed the same act as vanity or arrogance. Why? Because it's still about you. Right? It's still you in the way. It's still you standing in the way. It's just the flip side of the same coin. So as opposed to, I may not be worthy of a lot of things, but Allah is worthy of me being better. That's how you get yourself out of the way. You're welcome. Ya Allah, give me ikhlas. Ya Allah, give me siddhah. Ya Allah, just be a beggar. Ya Rabbi, here I am at your door again. <laughs> Begging, Ya Rabbi, make me a person of ikhlas. Make me a person of siddhah. Right? And honestly, having moments where you sit with yourself and you tell yourself the truth. You have to have moments with yourself where you sit with yourself and tell yourself the flat truth. You know the story of the one who entered into the masjid, right? And the Prophet said, so the next person who enters into the door is Ahlul Jannah. And they said, what is it? You know, the companions are like, I wonder what it is about him. And Omar stayed with him for three days. And in the end, right, he's like, I don't see anything so great, special about you. I didn't see you get up for fasting. I didn't get to see you get up for Qiyam al And they said, no, I don't. They said, there's only one thing that I do every night I sit before I go to bed and I think about my day and I ask myself, is there anything that, I, is there anyone who did something to me that I will, that I need to forgive them for? And is there anything about myself right, that I need to seek someone else's forgiveness or a, a trait that I need to uproot it from my heart? Right? So the fact that he didn't, and then Omar and said, that's why, <laughs> that's, that's the quality that Muraqaba that self-watching and being able to tell yourself the truth, right? To be able to sit and say, you know, to go through your day and say, I wasn't very kind to the cashier. I'm just giving an example. I wasn't very kind to the cashier. And then say, well, what is the root of that? Why weren't you kind to the cashier? Uh, well, I was tired. Okay, well, that's not a reason to put it on the cashier, right? Yeah, actually, because I, I thought I was better than her. Because she was just a mere cashier and I have a PhD or whatever. When you can keep tracing the root, now you can repent for the reality. Because you're just telling yourself, oh, I'm just tired. You're giving yourself the excuse. Which means you're going to commit it again against somebody else. Next will be the waitress. Right? So being able to sit with myself and say, well, why was I, you know, why did I behave that way? Oh. The truth is I felt, I feel entitled. I feel like I should have that. Why should you have it? Because, because I'm from Florida. <laughs> Whatever it is. Like we tell her, I mean, we laugh. 
right? But there are different things we tell ourselves. Um, because I'm American. Because I'm I don't because I'm African American. Because my daddy used to spoil me. <laughs> Why can't the rest of the world? <laughs> I don't know, whatever it is. You know, whatever the root is, but we have it. There's a root, you know. Um, there's a root for sure. Uh, why were you mean to her? I was jealous. Why are you jealous of her? Because she's beautiful. And I don't actually believe that I'm that beautiful. So really I'm insecure about my own beauty. So I was jealous of her, so then I was mean. It's that, it's, we gotta be able to sink, just, Take a deep breath and go a little deeper. <laughs> and ask yourself, interrogate yourself. Interrogate your nafs. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why were you impatient about that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> interrogate your nafs. I'm so serious. Before we're interrogated. Yeah. And your, and your shayateen, by the way. <laughs> Pin them to the wall. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. You sit and speak to them. Kul a'ubu bi Rabbil Falak min sharri ma khalaq wa min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab. And I seek refuge in Allah from you, and I'm about to read on you. You shayateen and qari who walk around with me every day. I'm 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 reciting ayat to curse on you. <laughs> I'm telling Allah on you. <laughs> you acting out. You calling me to all kind of foolishness. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. You guys think I'm kidding. I'm serious. I am serious. <laughs> you guys are reciting. You're reciting your afkar in the morning. You're, who are you reciting it for? Right? You're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows you're seeking refuge in you when you're talking about the. the Sometimes we're putting it. That's the funny thing. <laughs> Sometimes we're putting it on the act. I'm seeking refuge in you, you magician. Actually, I'm seeking refuge in and Allah from you. <laughs> I'm seeking refuge in Allah. You, you, subhanAllah, you temperamental chick. <laughs> you gotta talk to yourself. <laughs> Yes. Drown them out. You know how you drown them out? You ever been in a house and you 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 heard something or something scared you, and you play I to like you pray Surah to Bakara real loud. You ever did that? <laughs> Do that to your nafs. I'm about to drown you out. I'm, we, I'm about to play this Quran so loud till you can't think about nothing else. <laughs> I'm so, I am serious, right? But right now, I really want to listen to Beyonce. I'm in the car. <laughs> you about to turn this bucket on real loud. <laughs> Until you just hear just that. Until you drown out your own thoughts. <laughs> Don't worry, we have days like that. But work on it, right? I'm serious. Like, you know, Imam Al Haddan, he talks of like this, uh, like dragging your nafs to obedience. Honestly, dragging your nafs to obedience, because if not, they will drag you into laziness, into ghafla, into heedlessness. So it's when they talk about fighting against your nafs, that's a real. Sometimes it's a real fight. Sometimes it's a it's a real struggle. Like, you know, I can see today. You know, there are days like, I, oh, I can see you're not gonna let me rest today. You you you're not gonna let me have peace today. I can see. So I okay, that's fine. I'm I'm about to uh, I'm about to call the big dog. <laughs> I'm about to play his bonasar on you. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm about to pull out his bonasar. Right. Oh, okay. I oh you. 
Oh, okay. I see you. Um, you want to make you know you want to make me pick a fight. Today you want me to pick a fight with my husband. <laughs> oh, okay, that's what you're doing. Yeah. No, we're not doing that. I'm. Th- <laughs> Man, I'm about to pay with a little teeth. Loud. <laughs> but I'm, you, I'm serious. You have to, you know, you, uh, you have to split yourself. I know that sounds weird. Don't worry. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> it's gonna be okay, right? Like you have to put your nub. Like you have to say, okay, I'm talking to you, nubs. I'm talking to you, Shahu. I'm talking to you, my desire, and you, the Shaya thing. I'm talking to you. You, I'm not even going to speak to directly. I'm just going to fucking and gnash you to death. <laughs> I had to curse you right into submission. Like, I, I know you, because if not, when you keep doing it in your, you, we don't have the strength. We have to call for backup. We have to call for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to run. And pray to Raka'at and say, Ya Rabbi, I'm running to you. I'm, I'm, I'm just seeking, I'm seeking refuge in you. They are after me. Ya Rabbi, these shayateen, they're after me. My nafs is after me today. Ya Rabbi, I need help. Sometimes I know, the yes, the atkar are, MashaAllah, Tabarak Rahman, the atkar with concentration, they definitely work. But sometimes we need a way to the atkar. Sometimes it's difficult. Like the Athkar is like over there, right? And you're like, my nafs won't let me get up off this chair. <laughs> I won't even push it on the phone. <laughs> I could just put it on play. I can't even do that. You have to just, subhanAllah, I think about with the Prophet, وسلم, he used to sit and make tayammum before he would go to make wudu. Part of it was about let me put out the flames of shaitan even before unless something tried to distract me between here and my wudu. Also, it was like just in, like I'm just I'm just gonna do an act of ibadah. Like let me just help. Sometimes you have to even make du'a. Ya Rabbi, bless me to read. That's why the du'a, Allahumma aani ala dhikrik wa shukrik wa husnihi wa datik. Oh Allah, help me remember you. Help me make dhikr of you. Help me be grateful to you. So I can actually get the strength in the mind to say the adhkar. Right? I just I'm seeking refuge in you from my laziness. We all fall into that. Don't, you know? I, mean, I say that to say, I say that we all fall into it to say you're not alone. Right? Um... But it doesn't mean, it doesn't absolve us of responsibility. We still have to do something. We have to fight. Have to fight. First, the moment, the shimmering light of Habib Omar. Just reciting it and reading it and reading it and reading it. Um, the other thing is the Shema and reading the Shema. I can remember the moment, to be honest. It was the, the narration where it described the Prophet is that when he was amongst people, if they laughed, he laughed. And whatever they talked about, he would talk about that. And if they were, you know, if they were happy, he would be happy. And if they were like awed by something, he would and that for me was like fascinating. Right? Like learning that the Prophet وسلم, was not, he wasn't the buzzkill at a party. Right? He wasn't the one that was like, you know, he was relatable and fun. And the fact that, you know, uh, he laughed so you could see his molars. Just a, just imagine seeing that. Like seeing him, you know, to see someone's molars, that means they have to put their head back, you know, and laugh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I'm a crazy woman. I talk to the prophet. <laughs> you got to be a little crazy. <laughs> and people are like, what? What are you saying, Sister Aisha? When I heard that he's alive in his grave, right, and you send salawat, I, there's, every time you send salawat, there's an angel that wraps your salawat 
and goes and stands in a line to give your sal uh, salam to the Prophet except on Laylatul Jum'ah. <laughs> so on Laylatul Jum'ah, he hears it directly and then he responds by your name. So then I was like, so that's it, <laughs> right? Salam alaik ya Rasulullah. So this is what happened. Salam alaik ya Rasulullah. If I, you know, he would touch some salawat in between, he's alive in his grave, right? This is a mujizat. This is a this is our aqidah. This is what we believe that the anbiya are alive in their graves, right? This is like a, it's a matter of our deen. And so send salawat on him. Read about him. Uh, you know, find something, you you know what causes your heart to love, right? We all have something like that pulls our heart to love someone. Find out what is that thing. The Prophet he has it, right? And just keep walking that path and think about it and send salawat and think about that and send salawat. Like him and Aisha racing on horses. <laughs> that was so cute <laughs> right of like him in the masjid and she's sitting on his shoulders right as she's like watching you know the ethiopian military dancers that for me and he's like you finish nah i hit supper with her um you know there's lots of things like you know for me so you have to find there's not everything you know, there's some things like, oh, that doesn't, you know, everybody has that key to their own heart. You have to know what is that key to your heart with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And just keep thinking about that and dwelling on that. You know, when you love someone, you keep thinking about, if you've ever been in love, I, or, you're like, remember that time we were walking in the park? Remember that time we saw the dolphins? Remember that time we, <laughs> you have to do that with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? I remember that time he was talking to Aisha and I can't remember, I can't imagine like how, what was he thinking when those girls were singing to him, Ta'ala and Badru Halayna. I like thinking about him and Abu Bakr in the cave. You know, you have to know what's your thing. Or like the time he's sleeping and uh, Sophia, his aunt, he, he's sweating. It's hot in the middle of the day and he's sweating. And she has a bottle, right? And she's collecting his sweat. And he wakes up. And he's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> right? That for me is fun. like it's just funny. Like he's it's just such a real moment. If you woke up and somebody had a bottle next to you, you'd be like, "What are you doing?" You know that for me. Yeah, we have to. For me, it's his. It's those real when he's just you know, just with his family and. Those for me are the, the moments of love. Okay. So the first thing is if, when you seek refuge in Allah from shaitan and you still have this conversation, that's your nafs. <laughs> right? It's like, I sought refuge from Allah and this is still circling. That's you. <laughs> right? So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that um, your nafs is not necessarily negative. Right, meaning that the nafs is actually neutral, and this is actually something subhanallah a lot of people confuse because for the most part it's down, but that's our attachment to dunya that actually pulls it down. But our nafs can actually raise up when we are more attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so it's literally like a pendulum. So when we are more attached to dunya, um, it's our nafs that causes, like, I really just want to sleep, I just really want to. Actually, I just want to. I just want to binge watch Netflix. I want to, you know, that part. It's actually not necessarily a bad thing, right? I just want to. I just want to binge watch Netflix. When does Shaitan come in? When I want to watch something I know I should. Right? I like this. Like, hmm. I'm interested in this. That. Yeah. Hey, that even maybe normally I wouldn't. I think it's not something I'm interested in. Well, let me get curious about that. Now we're makes sense. Now we're going down a path we shouldn't. Um, the other thing is, is that in, I actually, you know, the psychology. You have to talk to Dr. Ronnie or like the psychology behind imposter syndrome and all of that. I'm not so intelligent about that. I'm. Um, the only thing when that happens to me 
As I say, it really doesn't matter. Meaning, and why do I say it doesn't matter? Because, okay, if I'm not true, y'all don't be making me true. And well, are you sincere about that? Y'all don't be making me sincere. You know, y'all don't be, this whispering is it's trying to help me. I'm, I'm running to you away from whatever this voice is, whatever this West West is. Whether it's for me or something like that. Um, and in the end, it doesn't matter. Meaning that the self-doubt we have is also a trick. It's just trying to get in your way. It's just trying to be a hurdle. Right? It's just trying to keep you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I'm putting you on blast too. <laughs> right? Like, even if I think, Ya Allah, I'm, even I, in one of the du'as I make, is Allah, make me Muslim. Make me a Muslim. Some days I'm Muslim, some days, you know, all of us. Because Muslim is one who actively submits to the will of Allah. Right? Some days we're like, Ya'll be I know that's your will. <laughs> you know? And so, push. I'm, I might not be Muslim yet, but I'm still going to pray and ask Allah to make me a Muslim. Because I want to be a Muslim. Right? Law. It doesn't, I, I think we are confusing, I think we think that somehow we're going to always want to, we're going to want to want it. And we don't always want to want it. That's the truth of it. Like sometimes I have to tell myself, Ya Allah, I don't, you know me, I don't really want to fast. Mondays and Thursdays, I really don't. I'd rather eat. I'd rather drink coffee and eat some ice cream. That's my nafs. My nafs is like, <laughs> we could just like wait to rum <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, that's nafs. So I have to say, Allah, the truth is I don't want to. And that's the truth. Can you make me want to want to? Can you cause my heart to yearn for it? Can you put the inclination to worship you in my heart? And, you know, I think this is saying that time is up. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> With the candy. I love the sweetness of it all. <laughs> so, um, so that's it, right? Like really saying, again, that's that thing about when we tell ourselves the truth. Like, I'm Muslim. Sometimes I struggle. Sometimes I want to do it. Sometimes I don't want to do it. Oh Allah, give me istiqamah in wanting to worship you. And even the Prophet وسلم, he mentioned about when he said that sometimes you don't feel connected. Believe it or not, not feeling connected is not a bad thing. What do I mean by that? Because then you know you're not worshiping Allah for the feeling. You know you're not committing that shirk of I'm worshiping Allah because, because I'm going to get this feeling from it. The truth is, maybe from my perspective, right, from my vahir perspective, I'm not feeling anything right now. But I didn't worship because of me. I worship because Allah, I'm, I'm worshiping Allah. I, it wasn't about me. So in my worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I feel it, well, alhamdulillah. If I didn't feel it, well, alhamdulillah. It's not. Do you, under, you understand what I'm saying? That's not going, our emotions should not, that's, that's our nuts trying to drag and pull us all over the room. Right? Some people say, well, when I feel it, then I'll pray. No, 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 no. That's a trick. Um, Shaitan is just trying to use our feelings and our emotions, you know. Uh, so we, we, I'm here. I'm showing up. Ya Rabbi, please attach my heart to you. Ya Rabbi, I'm asking you for Sakina. I'm asking you for the sweetness of Iman. I'm asking you for the sweetness in my prayer. But that's what I was saying in the beginning. What if I never get the sweetness of prayer? What if I never gain it? Do I stop worshiping Allah? Absolutely not. Because His Allah is still that. His Allah is not dependent on my feelings. So, I, you know, it's very intelligent, like imposter syndrome. I, I don't know about that. We're all, sometimes we're all just, 
faking it to make it. Allah make me sincere. Please make me sincere. Ya Rabbi, make me sincere. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.